Oh, wow. Well, take the Bible right yesterday. <laughs> Welcome to Glenda Jackson. Well, thank you um, very much. I'm going to start with a personal question because when yeah. I was a college student, my favorite writer was D.H. Lawrence. Oh, wow. It was partly because um, of the way his lush, vigorous prose kind of tried to celebrate sensuality. So I was wondering, when you were playing Gudrun in Ken Russell's Women in Love, how much of your characterization came from reading D.H. Lawrence? I think a fair amount of it. The actual script was written by two Americans, actually. Larry Kramer. Larry I Kramer being one. And um, the extraordinary thing about Lawrence is he, he can write a page and a half about the internal emotions that one of his characters is feeling. And they have to answer a question or just a response to a greeting. And after a page and a half of this detailed writing, they'll say yes, or no, <laughs> or maybe, or oh, thank you, and that's it. <laughs> and so that was very useful, actually. It gave you an indication of where they were. Good. Now, the very first role was Marassad, and yeah. um, the full title, of course, is the persecution and assassination of Jean-Paul Marat as performed by the inmates of the Asylum of Charenton under the direction of the Marquis de Sade. That was the full title the of full the play title. in 1965. Yeah. Now, you are fascinating to watch as the narcoleptic Charlotte Corday, yeah. who is about to assassinate Marat in his bathtub. And, and your jerky movements, they almost suggest someone who's forced to go on automatic pilot. And I, I was wondering, how did Peter Brook work with you to reshape a performance that you had done on stage for your very first major film role? I think with, no, I was about to say with some difficulty, but that would not be true. I mean, my own, when we saw it, the cast, I mean, my reaction was, what was all the fuss about? I mean, you know, what, why had people gone hysterical about this? But then I reflected, we did that play in London and every performance the audience sat in total silence until the end and then they applauded very nicely. We brought it to New York in the mid 60s and we're giving our first performance and the first song gets applause, shouts of encore. Um, the audience laughed in all the right places I hasten to add and the cast, myself included, came up off at the end and we were saying to each other, what play are we doing? What play are we doing? <laughs> what is it? What are we doing that's different? And it wasn't. It was just the marvelous reaction of a, a New York audience. I like to think that we are still like that. When you I are, you are. You uh, like us to know you're there. Yes. <laughs> you do. You do. And, but you like us to know you're there in the best of all possible ways. I mean, when you have to be quiet, certainly in this play and in the one I did last year. You are totally silent. I mean, so no, you're, you're great audiences. Okay, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Now, during the 23 years that you were making films, you worked with some of the great directors, Indeed. Peter Brook, Ken Russell, uh, Joseph Losey, yeah. and uh, Robert Altman, and oh, John yeah. Schlesinger. Mm -hmm. um, which do you think were able to elicit your best work and how? In other words, did you prefer directors who had rehearsal or who allowed improvisation or who simply elicited trust? To bring it down to the kind of basic line as far as I'm concerned, the really bad directors always know what they want. <laughs> it's true. They really do. The really good directors know what they don't want and they tell you in no uncertain terms. And that's great. And then I, I had been... I mean, my training, in a sense, had been that the first thing you leave outside the rehearsal room door is your ego. And so, with all those directors you mentioned, possibly with the exception of Joe Losey, sorry, I know he's American, but there we go. Um, it, they, well, I, John Schlesinger, I never went to see the rushes. I didn't want to know about those. And every morning, we'd gather on the set, and he'd be there, and he'd start out and he'd be saying, I've seen the rushes. We are, pardon my language here, we're engaged in a piece of shit. I mean, it's just dreadful. It's dreadful. 
And he always had the same lovely lady who was his prop lady, and he, she had long blonde hair in those days. And he would have a, a strand of her hair, and he was winding it round his finger, <laughs> like worry beads. And he's saying, you know, I mean, what are we doing? What do we think we're doing? I mean, well, actually, no, it, it's not. No, it's not that bad, really. And so he would work through this, starting out saying, we're all crazy trying to do this, to the point where he'd say, actually, it's rather good. OK, come on, let's do it. <laughs> and that's, you know, and all those directors um, were open. I mean, Ken Russell, you know, the clapper boy could come up with an idea and he'd listen. He might not necessarily use it, but he would always listen. They all did that, and that's amazing. And Liv Ullman actually crystallized it for me, relating an experience she'd had with the director that she'd always worked with. And she was playing this very vain woman in one of the films she did for him. And all her character had to do was walk down a corridor, there was no dialogue, walk down a corridor, and as she walked down this corridor, playing a vain woman, she checked her appearance in every reflective surface that she went past. And he, without any discussion about this, had set up a camera so that he caught her doing every one of those. That's the kind of director you want to work with, uh, <laughs> I tell you. Not everyone can have Ingmar Bergman, but, well, no, uh, but she did had. in more yes. ways than one. But yes. <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> And I guess a lot of it, because when I, I, I watched The Music Lovers again, oh, yes. uh, we could not get a DVD in order to have a clip, but I was struck by how much you really had to trust Ken Russell, so even more so than with Women in Love. There's a train sequence, for example, yeah. where your character, Nina, is trying to seduce her gay husband, Tchaikovsky, played by Richard Chamberlain. And it's just, besides the nudity, it's just so feverish and hyperbolic. And I thought, how does an actor put herself in the hands of a director with such confidence? Well, I had worked with him before, um, which makes a difference. And he, again, could always create the climate for you. Um, but we, that was, there was an extra shot. We'd done most of the scene in the train when they're going off on honeymoon. And he wanted an extra shot. So I'm rolling around naked on the floor. And in the set, there's a table there. This is on the train. And there's a bottle of champagne in a silver thingy and glasses. And the guys are rocking the train like this. So first of <laughs> all, the champagne bottle falls on me. The glasses fall on me. The thing falls on me. Cut. Just dry her up. She's all right. She's all right. <laughs> we'll go again. So we go again. Now, on the luggage rack there, there were these beautiful period metal pieces of luggage, right? So that's the next thing that falls on me. The bruises will never show. Come on, come on, get on it. Third take, and the cameraman who was up there on the other luggage rack is sitting in my lap. He's fallen off. He said, and he said to me, this is absolutely true, I'm a married man. I'm a married man. <laughs> marvelous. Just marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, and I'm getting a little of this now in listening to you, how in A Touch of Class, for example, you are so sardonic and self-possessed. And I was wondering what it was like for you to do your first American romantic comedy. Was the experience of making an American film early on in your career very different from what you had Totally, done? totally, in as much as George was the first American actor I'd worked with. and. It was the fashion then, which changed dramatically in my country. But for actors to pretend or present the idea of, of acting as being the least important thing in the world, you know, they'd sit there reading their newspapers and somebody would say, your cue's coming up, and they'd go, okay, fine. There was, now, I'll get back to touch class in a minute. When I was at the RSC, one of the favorite games in Stratford-upon-Avon was who could leave the green room last and still make their cue. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Anyway, there's George Siegel. Well, the energy that came off that guy was just astounding. I mean, you know, for him, as it is for, for all American actors, they're such a treat to work with. You know, acting is life or death. And there was this, just this amazing energy. So it was great. It was really great. Yeah. And 
I gather Melvin Frank offered you the part because he had seen Morecambe and Wise. Absolutely, he had, yes. And, and how did that come about? Was that they, they approached you and you knew their program? It, oh, well, they were the kings of British television at that time. I mean, they, their audiences were in the multi-millions. You know what I mean? They were just marvelous. And they approached me because they were doing this thing. And I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I couldn't wait to work with them. They were marvelous. And Eric gave me the best note I've ever had in my life. We did the rehearsal for the show, and his note to me was, louder and faster. <laughs> I mean, the best bloody note I've ever been given, <laughs> practically. practically. OK. <laughs> We're trying to give this audience a sense of the range. And I'll start with Mary, Queen of Scots, because your Elizabeth with Dudley is quite frisky. <laughs> um, I, I never had the feeling that this was a virgin queen, so to speak. <laughs> And um, you also played her in the TV miniseries, right. Elizabeth yeah. R. Um, oh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, given that you've played other real people, such as Sarah Bernhardt, right. Trish, the Patricia Neal story mm -hmm. um, with Dirk Bogard, do you, do you tend to do historical research on that given person, or do you anchor your performance more in the screenplay? Well, it depends who's written the script, really. Um, and I don't mean that in a, a sort of derogatory way, but I mean, certainly when we did Elizabeth R., I mean, I was privileged to be allowed to go to the National Archive and hold some of Mary Queen of Scots' letters. Um, and she'd invented her own code. And a rose was Elizabeth and a heart was her. I mean, a child of two could have worked out that code, couldn't they, bless them? Um, but it's, it, it's very, I mean, certainly for Elizabeth R., there is so much true facts about her life that when Mary Queen of Scots was much more, I think, invented in a way. But certainly, I mean, the closeness that she had with Dudley was intense. I mean, she kept his last letter. It was in the table by her bed, you know, when she was dying and things like that. And so it's that kind of mixture between, I mean, for example, the Patricia Neal story where Roald Dahl, she was married to Roald Dahl, and she had this heart attack, a stroke rather, in Los Angeles, and he brought her back to England. And the doctors at that time said, there's nothing we can do. She's had a stroke. She's lost the world. He engaged all their friends in the small village they lived in to come in every day and teach her and make her say what were the days of the week, what were the colors of the rainbow, things like that. On two occasions, she said she wanted to die. She couldn't put up with it. But he actually, as somebody said, he brought her out of the grave. And out of that work, we now have stroke associations. You know, if you have a stroke, there are treatments for you and developing what you've lost. And that's always amazing. But it is that balance between what is factual, historical, um, and just trying to find the person, really, because, you know, the person is something else, isn't it? Yes. You know. And because you did Elizabeth R. and mm. Mary Queen of Scots in the same year, 1971, it's also a way of my asking you whether you feel profound differences between creating a character for television or for the big screen? Or is the process for you pretty much the same? Well, the, pr the process of doing stays pretty much the same, except, of course, there are technical differences. I mean, between doing a film and doing television, for instance. A television camera in my day, and I know it's been transformed, they would have been just as happy shooting a football match or, you know, a garage as they were shooting the camera would be. Whereas a film camera, is absolutely obsessed with you. It has no other interest whatsoever. And that means that, you know, it, it, there's a kind of freedom in that. I mean, you don't have to worry, well, you do. I always accuse the sound people of being deaf. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you don't have those kind of things. Um, so, in a way, uh, but I think now, I mean, in my day, television was that kind of thing. But the great benefit of doing Elizabeth R was I worked with the same group of actors over six months. And that was so rare to have in, in television in those days. Um, the BBC never really conned on to the fact that we were doing a series. I would have a row every time 
because we did some shooting on location. But every three and a half weeks or so, we'd have three days in the studio shooting an episode. And I would have a row every time I arrived at um, White City because the guy on the gate would say, you can't park your car there. And I'd say, why not? Oh, no, that's just, that's management, that's office. I said, I'm here to shoot. We'd have this row every three weeks. Um, but apart from that, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> it was just an extraordinary thing to be able to do. It yeah. really was. Now, I love the rapport that you have in Hopscotch with oh, Walter Matthau's well, character. Oh, and it's one of two films that you did with that's him. That's right. Quite popular. The other was yes. House Calls. Yes. And here you play Isabel, who's crisp and relaxed <laughs> um, with him as she explains about wine and yes. perhaps life. And my question is whether, because we, we do associate you with drama, do you find comedic roles equally gratifying? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're much, much harder, I think, than drama. I mean, it is, I mean it's a bit of a cliche, um, but I think there's truth in it. If when you rehearse a scene before you actually perform it, and the people around laugh, you've got it wrong. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just somehow wrong. Um, and it is, I mean, it is really tough to do, but I've been very lucky. I mean, George was great to work with, and Walter, I mean, just what a joy to work with him. I mean, what a guy, he was great. And, and you obviously brought out the best in, in both of them yeah, in your scenes. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, they were both marvelous to work <laughs> with. Now, in 1973, you created Bowdoin Productions with Robert Enders yes. and others, and among Bowdoin's efforts at that time, there was Nasty Habits in 1977 mm -hmm. with Malina Mercury and Geraldine Page. I tried so hard to find this, but oh, did God. not succeed. The shame. Then um, in 78, Stevie, another film that's lost, but I remember when I saw it in the late 70s, beautiful performances by you and Mona Washburn mm -hmm. about the poet Stevie mm -hmm. Smith. And you also did Strange Interlude around this time yeah. on stage in 1985. And then for American television, it was done for American Playhouse in 1988. Um, I, yeah. So my question really is, did you feel the need to create a company like this because there was already a dearth of substantive female roles that were being offered? I think, I don't, I mean, it was not my idea. I was approached by the other people who were involved in it. And there were a lot of actors involved in it, Albert Finney, Maggie Smith, can't remember the others. Um, and it wasn't so much that it was a dearth of female roles. It was the feeling that there was a dearth of, well, sort of stories that had more than just violence or sex or something, you know, to make it sales-worthy, if that's the right word. And um, it, was they, it was interesting to me that, they, that as a company, we could engage producers who were interested in making films of plays that we'd done. You know, I mean, that was, and certainly doing Stevie was just great. I mean, I've told you, but I'll tell the audience. When we were doing the film with Stevie Smith, we were shooting up in this essentially lower middle class part of North London. And it was a row of houses, you know, a, a terrace of houses. And the house that Stevie and the lion aunt, her aunt, had lived in, the director didn't want that. It had a garden. He wanted the facade of the terrace. And these are houses, I mean, really, their front doors are 16 inches apart with a little wall in between. So we're outside the house that is supposed to be Stevie's. And the woman who lived next door comes to her front door and said to me, what are you doing? So I said, we're doing a film um, about Stevie Smith. Oh, she said, who was he? <laughs> so I said, no, no, I said, it, Stevie Smith, she lived with her aunt in the end house. Oh, she said, do you mean Peggy? And I said, yeah, Peggy. Now, you see, I found that marvelous about Stevie Smith. There she was, she'd lived there for, it must have been 30 odd years. And she'd fulfilled absolutely the expectations of a lower middle class community and neighborhood. She'd been a good niece to her, you know, maiden aunt and things like that. They had no knowledge at all that she was creative in the way that she was, that she published books, that she wrote poetry, that she worked for literary organizations. And I thought, you know, she was an amazing, amazing woman that she met those kinds of needs. Um, I, as I said to you, she reminded me quite a bit of Emily Dickinson, who also had that capacity 
to live in an interior world and yet still meet the requirements of the exterior world. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And also, if I remember correctly, another Bowdoin production at that time was The Maids. Oh, wow. Um, which yeah. we didn't have time to include yeah. as many clips yeah. as we would have liked, but uh, you and Susanna York, right. directed by Christopher Miles in the Jean Genet play, very much about the questioning of performance yeah, and artifice absolutely. and yeah. illusion. Yeah. Also a theme shared in another film of yours, The Romantic English Woman, oh that well Joseph yes, Losey directed. Yes, yes. Another one that we don't have in our mm -hmm. clips for tonight. Mm -hmm. Watching this film from 1987-88, I had the feeling that it was quite prescient. Um, not, well, about a, a number of things, including your political career. Oh, right. Um, so I'm gonna just mention that this is Leslie Ann Barrett's directorial debut, debut and you pl played Babs. Um, whose employee complains that a regional manager has been making uh, inappropriate moves. She tells the manager he fires her. She reluctantly agrees with her family to go public and let the union support them, which includes public picketing. And she addresses this huge audience of Labour Party members to ask for justice. The image in this film of Thatcher's England is a place where men are unemployed, where women's jobs are tenuous, and I couldn't help but wonder whether this film, though it was a small one on TV, mm. might have encouraged the Labour Party to ask you to run for office and whether playing this character might have encouraged you to become more involved politically. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> because uh, the Labour Party had asked me to participate in fundraising and writing begging letters and going to appalling dinners, all the same thing, um, from about the mid-70s. I was never quite sure it was because I had a name that people recognized, a face that people recognized. Anyway, they'd used me. And so when this film came along, um, it was so close to everything that I was personally feeling, politically thought we had to do something about, that it was a kind of gift, really. But we had to wait another four years before she left. Right, right. Um, I'm going to come back to the political aspect of oh your yes, life in a moment, okay. but I did have a question because I started to look at some of the 80s films which were hard to find, but I managed on YouTube, and I noticed that in at least three of your 1980s films, you play characters with a moral backbone who refuse to compromise, and I was wondering if you were drawn to Babs in Business as Usual, to playing Yelena Bonner, the wife of Sakharov, oh yeah. in the HBO um, movie yeah. starring Jason Robards, and also I, a film called Gyro City by uh, Carl Francis, playing a TV producer who yeah. has real grit. Um, were you drawn to play characters of integrity? Was that something that was conscious, or it was just the project seemed? Well, I'd like to say it was, but it wasn't in truth, because you, I mean, you, you you know, you don't know what's going to come through the front door as far as the script is concerned, and you can only work when there's something to work on. But with all those, yes, I mean, I had a natural sympathy for this, the central characters. And there was always something that was, well, I mean, that clip from, you know, the last one we saw. I mean, I, I muttered the Me Too movement early on to you, but, you know, one of the things that I think we delude ourselves with as a human race is that bad behavior is limited to certain professions, to certain economic standards. It happens to women. If some poor woman is being, is, is experiencing it, even as we speak, not that far from where we are. And certainly if you look at the world as a whole, we have made huge strides forward, I think, but we're by no means equal yet. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's more than just kind of sexual harassment. It's that whole range of, I'll put it in what is my perception. If a woman is a success, it is presented as though she is the exception that proves the rule. If a woman is fail, fails, it's because we're all useless. And that really hasn't fundamentally changed yet. Hmm. It's true. <laughs> now, you obviously took a break from acting to becoming <laughs> proactive <laughs> in uh. the theater of politics, if we can oh put it that way. God, yeah. um, to what extent, <laughs> to what extent did you feel, or do you feel, that performance is central also to being a member of parliament? It's another way of asking, what did you learn from acting 
that informed your political work? The only benefit that I think I had, I mean, years ago, I was here doing a play, and there'd been a long study into what we as human beings fear most, and we fear death most, and the second thing we fear most, apparently, is public speaking. <laughs> yeah, and that was not a problem for me. I mean, I'd, I'd done that. But, the, you know, the Chamber of the House of Commons has cameras and microphones in it now, but I never remember being aware of them being there, and I didn't really see that my colleagues, whichever side of the aisle were on, were aware of it either. That view has now cracked in when I see the utter chaos that they're in over Brexit. I mean, I just cannot believe what I see, because I know some of these people. I mean, they're intelligent, they're knowledgeable, they're reasonable, and they're all behaving like overspoiled babies, and you think, get a grip, come on, you know. <laughs> Honestly, it's just bizarre. It's bizarre. But there is this element that I've seen in terms of footage from Parliament where people get up and they make their claim knowing that they are performing in, in a certain sense because they have to gain, they have to convince, they have to persuade. Well, I, would, I really question that because yes, that may be their idea, but they're speaking in the main to a very unappreciative audience, right. you know. I mean, it's an absolute given. I mean, whichever side of the aisle you're on, the people sitting opposite you are going, oh, for heaven's sake, what are you talking about? This is rough. You know, that kind of thing is there. The, the really, well, for me, I mean, interesting and humbling was actually being a member of parliament for a constituency because we hold advice surgeries and total stranger would come into the room, one of your constituents, uh, never seen them before, they'd never met you before, and they would lay their life out on the table in front of you. And it was because you, as their member of parliament, was their port of last resort. All the other avenues had produced nothing for them. And sometimes those lives were absolutely ghastly through no fault of their own. And sometimes you got the result they wanted and sometimes you didn't. But they always, always said thank you. And that was one of the most humbling experiences you can go through. I mean, it is amazing that people actually vote for you. Do you know what I mean? That is, uh, no, it, I mean, when you think of what is inherent in, in that right to vote, and, you know, you're one of those people who have an X put by the side of your name, it is extraordinary. One of the things I held most against Margaret Thatcher was she asked what had the suffragettes ever done for her? Well, I could have told her, you know, in a very short space of time. God, I... <laughs> <laughs> Honest <laughs> God. But I, I appreciate what you're saying because I remember learning many years ago that the word politics, the root word of that, polis, is person. In other yeah. words, it is the yeah. individual yeah. relationships Absolutely. that you create with the people Absolutely. who you do and for whom you can do good. Yeah. It's much less about what we sometimes associate with politics as policy making as the stentorian right. element of, let's say, yeah. parliament. But for our last part of conversation, I do feel the need to move into your contemporary existence because you went last year from uh, being one of Edward Albee's three tall women yeah. to incarnating Shakespeare's towering man. Yeah. And in talking about King Lear, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the difference between doing the current production on Broadway mm -hmm. directed by Sam Gold and the version that you did with the Old Vic yeah. in 2016, which was yeah. directed by Deborah, Deborah Warner, which yeah. I did not see. I, I did see the recent one, thank goodness. Yeah. I'll tell you more about that. But is it a different experience? Well, it is in as much as, well, physically, when we did it in England, it was a bare stage, apart from miles of bloody black plastic when we did the hovel scene. I still don't know why we did it like that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But the, the fundamental difference, of course, is I'm working with actors I've never worked with before. Um, and as I've already said, you know, the amazing thing, of, well, we've got better at it in England, I must admit. But American, <laughs> no, no, what we've got better at is expressing how important acting is to us. Well, American <laughs> actors have no problem with that at all. I mean, it is, as I said earlier, you know, about George, it's life and death. 
And so that energy is there always, which is amazing. And there is such an extraordinary energy in the play. And if you can manage to tap into that, you know, it's like a jet plane that just carries you along. And of course, well, no, actually, I was about to say a marked difference as far as the audiences are concerned, but that isn't true. I mean, there are great similarities in the way American audiences react to the play as there was in England, which I must say did surprise me quite a bit, but I'm grateful for the way you always like to let us know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I found something a few weeks ago in an email from Henry Jaglum. He, he was a close friend of Orson Welles, oh and right. he recorded their conversations over lunch. And I found this from Orson Welles quite intriguing, and I, I'd yeah. like to read this. <clears throat> Welles said, Othello is destroyed easily because he never understood women. Same with Lear. He knows nothing of the complexity of women. He has never known women, never lived with women. He's the all-male man who lives with his knights and who Shakespeare, who was clearly tremendously feminine, as are all great artists, clearly considered a natural-born loser, unquote. <laughs> and I was wondering whether now that you've been playing this mm. character, mm. would you agree with that vision of Lee? Not, not entirely. I mean, I certainly agree that Lear, he's a guy no one has ever said no to him in his entire life. Um, he's never really loved anybody in that sense. And the discovery of love and you know what it means is all comes too late for him. Um, but one of the things that I found helpful when I came to do it, as a member of parliament, I would have to visit old people's homes, day centers, places where people with disabilities were being helped, things like that. And as we grow older, those absolute fundamental, well, they're not fundamental, actually, we're taught, those absolute barriers between of gender definition begin to crack, they begin to fray, they get a bit foggy. You know, you, you do see elderly men who, in their 70s, we're all living longer now, aren't we? But would never have cried in public, they do. And you see women who would never have raised their voice, do. And that I found very useful when it comes to playing Leo and age. And the other curious thing about the, well, one of the curious things about the role, I mean, it's an incredible play to do. I'm such a privilege, but he, uh, what, what is it exactly I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say here about him? He. He's presented as being, an, uh, well, he is, he admits to being 80, but it's a, actually, it's a young man's part. I mean, because he has huge energy, I mean, this character, and it really, that energy is there right up until the very, very end. And I can believe, um, having gone through it, you know, that his heart actually breaks. I mean, that's why he dies. But there's huge energy in that guy, yeah. Hmm. Would you have approached the character any differently if it had been Queen Lear? In other words, if the character were a woman? I know this may seem like a st stupid question, but I, I hope to develop this a little bit. Well, I think there would have been difficulty because I can't envisage, um, even though, I mean, it was written, you know, after the reign of Elizabeth I, um, I can't envisage um, a woman at that time being invested with that kind of power, even though she did. I mean, somebody said to me, having played Elizabeth, you find links with Lear. The most marked not link is that I said, you know, Lear, had, no one has ever said no to that guy, ever, ever, until the end. Well, the middle, actually. She lived on a knife edge all her life, well, not, yeah, even when she was queen, but certainly up until the point that she became queen, when she was 25, I think. Every single day of her life, she was living under the possibility that there would be some action against her and her head would be chopped off. And, you know, I mean, imagine living with that reality. I mean, one minute, you know, you're being dressed beautifully and your father's putting gold necklaces on you for Christmas. The next minute, your mother's having her head chopped off and you are just being sort of shuttled around. I mean, you're sometimes allowed to go and see your father, nine times out of 10, you're not. Your sister 
regard you as, you know, a native-born enemy. I mean, what a life. And she still managed, you know, to get through it and be witty at the same time. I can't get over that. <laughs> I was actually thinking more of one of my favorite Shakespeare play, the Scottish play, because oh, you right, played yeah, Lady Macbeth. Yeah, yeah. And in that play, there's a magnificent moment where Lady Macbeth says, unsex me here. Mm -hmm. And it is almost the cry of a kind of male energy mm -hmm. in a female body who I think believes her husband is, is physically and, and figuratively impotent. And it's almost as if Lear is, a, it's a very different kind of character, but it could have been some sort of a female identity inside, I, I, yeah, I don't want to rewrite Shakespeare. Maybe what I'm really asking is whether you would agree that the reason Shakespeare's plays, his words, are so vibrant today, equally mm -hmm. as when Absolutely. he was writing, Absolutely. is that his plays are about, and Lear is about, how you have to try on a variety of roles until you find the one that fits best. It's very much about a performative oh. being. No? I don't know, I don't agree with that. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, he's the most contemporary dramatist there is because he's essentially, it seems to me, always asking three questions. Who are we? What are we? Why are we? And no one has come up with comprehensive answers as yet. I mean, human nature is immutable. We can improve the human condition. Please, God, keep pushing us to do it. But we, I mean, you know, you could walk down the street anywhere in the world and bump into a character out of King Lear or any other Shakespearean play because we don't change. When, you know, it, it really comes down to it, we keep saying, we keep making the same terrible mistakes, don't we? I mean, we're all mad. Well, that was Einstein's definition of us, wasn't it? Well, keep making the same mistakes, expecting a different result, you're crazy. <laughs> And King Lear is very much a play about legacy. Oh, about yes. About inheritance. Yes, yes. I mean, what do you feel we are leaving to the next generations, or what should we be? It's in the play. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm going to paraphrase, because they're not my lines. But I mean, there's Edmund moaning that he's only going to get his father's money when he's too old to enjoy it, right? What do we hear from millennials? We're never going to be able to buy a house. We're never going to be able to have a better life than our parents. It's more of an echo, isn't it? I mean, isn't that what it is? Yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely. Mm. I have a lot more questions, but I have a feeling that many people in this audience <laughs> would like a chance at oh, that as well. So if you raise your hand, I will try to see you and repeat your question. There is a gentleman all the way. There are two people in the back, I think. Yes, the gentleman. Yes. Hello. My God. Oh, wow. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do now? What do you do now? Uh, <laughs> 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 yes, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah.
it was one of the most fascinating experiences I'd ever had. I'd never seen puppeteers work. And those people, I mean, they would be lying on their stomachs, some of them, on the set, with a little video camera that they were seeing what was actually on the set, and doing the lines and actually manipulating the Muppets. I mean, their skill was just incredible. And the other amazing thing was the most human beings on that set were the Muppets. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just extraordinary. I mean, there I was, a human being, and there were these infinitely more realistic things going on. <laughs> it was just amazing. It was, a real, it was a real treat to be able to participate in that and see those skills. And what is fascinating to me is I'm pretty certain that the Muppets have, in that sense, grown, I mean, physically. But, you know, we did a war horse at the National Theatre, which had real horse-sized Muppet, uh, you know, puppets on the stage and used. And, I mean, also um, his Dark Materials is being done. And, you know, all the characters in Dark Materials have their animal who is their kind of inner spirit. And that's being made into a series in the BBC. And I only mention that because Ruth Wilson is in it and she's in Lear. And I was asking her about, you know, how, and she said exactly the same, her reaction is exactly the same as mine. To see these people creating these real characters, I mean, it's just it's extraordinary. So, yeah, it was great, it was great. Okay, um, over here on the aisle, yes. Well, thank you. What made you decide to go into Parliament and what determined your exit? Anything I could have done that was legal, that would have got Margaret Thatcher and her government. <laughs> out of office, I was prepared to have a go at. As I said earlier, um, from about the mid 70s, the Labour Party had asked me to do things for them. I'm a member of the Labour Party and I was happy to do it. And constituencies had approached me because they, whenever there's a, you know, an election brewing, if their incumbent MP isn't standing again, they have to get a prospective candidate. And um, I had been approached by a variety of constituencies. And then Hampstead and Highgate approached me, which is a North London constituency. And I don't know whether this is true or this is just a fantasy I've built for myself. But she said there was no such thing as a society. And I was so outraged by that, I walked into my closed French windows and almost broke my nose. <laughs> and I, I mean, it may be my fantasy that that deathless quote from Madame Thatcher came about the time that Hampstead and I get approached me. And I thought, yeah. I'll have a go. I never expected to be selected. I certainly didn't expect to win the seat. And I was wrong on both expectations. And after that, I was there in Parliament for 23 years. But um, <laughs> we didn't, I mean, my party didn't, we thought we were going to be in government. The week before, I began to sense we weren't. And we didn't get into government until 97. But yeah, yeah, that's why. Anything, I mean, I can't tell you, well, I can what my country was like under that. The schools in my constituency, for instance, the state schools in my constituency in every state school across the country, the kids, the parents, the teachers, anyone who was interested spent all their spare time trying to raise money to buy things as basic as paper and pencils. There wasn't a computer in any school. And now, you. You can't get through the door for whiteboards. Do you know what I mean? I mean, kids have laptops that they're given to take home, do their homework. The NHS was, she was trying, she, she knew she couldn't take it out of being a national health service, but she did things like, you know, hospitals couldn't employ directly um, cleaners. They had to be contracted out. And um, so the NHS was going through rough times. I mean, not just on the cleaning level. Housing, I mean, there was not a shop doorway in London or any major city in my country during that time 
which wasn't the bedroom, living room, bathroom for someone who had nowhere to live. I mean, it was absolutely, and you know, and she was going around as though it was all marvelous. And it wasn't all marvelous. And we are still paying the price for that, in my opinion, because those areas of the country where the indigenous industry had gone, shipbuilding, steel building, all those kinds of things, and no real effort was made to reconstitute those areas of the country. Um, they were, some of them were the most, ab almost 100% voted for us to come out of the European Union because of that. Yes. So there we go. And the decision to leave? Uh, well, I'd done it for 23 years, and I thought it was about time to give someone else a go. And um, that's why, yeah. Yes, gentleman there. Well, there's no meeting of minds there, friend. <laughs> You're not I serious. I just want to make sure that everybody, I just want to make sure everyone serious. heard the question Sorry. whether the Margaret Thatcher My quote God. about the suffragettes was absolutely corroborated because he claims that he tried to find the quote and could not and that it might have been a situation where um, it was not quoted accurately. Like what, for instance? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, I, you, you have spoken um, in other interviews about how the current parliament has treated Theresa May. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The question is, are, do you see similarities between the current Theresa May situation and the Margaret Thatcher, given that there have been um, eulogies about Margaret Thatcher that uh, seem to be, I'm sorry, it was a very long description. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I there was. Post her death, um, there was a day when there were eulogies for Margaret Thatcher. And indeed, it was her own party that had kicked her out because they knew that the policy she had introduced, called the council tax, they were going to lose their seats. The Conservatives were not going to win if she took them into a general election again. What happened, I just find it absolutely scandalous, the way Theresa May is being treated, not only by her own party and my party, but by the political commentators in my country. She's the only grown up in the room when it comes to the Brexit negotiations. And, I mean, a friend who was elected at the same time as me, he's a conservative, I'm Labour, um, in 92, he came to see the play on, I think it was Thursday night, and I said to him, what's happened to you all? I mean, you've all gone crazy, haven't you? Because the opposition to Theresa May is with, in a, in a curious way, it's, it's, within her party, it's within, it's within every political party in Parliament at the moment. But they've sort of gone egomaniacal almost, those MPs. I mean, because we've got to have a deal. We can't crash out. Well, if we do, that's it. I mean, heaven only knows what happens then. And she keeps trudging backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, talking to everybody in Parliament None of them have a deal that's better than hers, as far as I can work out. And we'll just have to wait and see what they decide to do before August the 21st, when we're supposed to come out. But her approach is entirely different to Margaret Thatcher. I mean, she, 
Theresa May is very much a feminist. I mean, she doesn't sort of wave flags, but she's all, when she was Home Secretary, I mean, she was always pushing in those kinds of areas. Do you know what I mean? Well, for Margaret Thatcher, I mean, partly, I think, because of the world in which she was raised, partly because she obviously adored her father in many ways, but she had little or no time for women. Well, let's be honest, she had little or no time for anyone that didn't agree with her. So, you know, and certainly towards the end, I think she, she went to the mayoral dinner, which all MPs do once a year, dressed as though she was Queen Elizabeth. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and one of our MPs, when her grandson or granddaughter was born, she said, we have a grandchild. And, you know, there were all these, and one of our MPs said, well, let's hope um, the grandchild learns to crawl as quickly as those people have just spoken to you. <laughs> okay, we're going to take this gentleman right here. Would you like to comment on American politics at the present moment? Well, I would, but I'm a guest in your country, so I won't. <laughs> Preston on the aisle. I have to play it every night. Uh, the question, what, what is Sorry. your biggest dream right now? Is there a role that you would want to play? And as I said, I have to play it every night. And every night is the first time I've done it. And that's pretty much a big enough thing to carry at the moment, thank you. And, and I have a follow-up question, because I was fortunate enough to see King Lear about uh, 10 days ago or two yeah. weeks ago. And I must say, it, it's one of the truly formidable performances that I've seen on stage. I was not quite prepared for this King Lear. I've seen yeah. various versions yeah. before. In this um, gender-blind production, you come right. out in a tuxedo, right. and the first scene is very public. It's the monarch yes. with his daughters, the husbands, and your presence on that stage is so commanding. Your elocution, your movements are so persuasive that after about five minutes, I forgot that this was Glenda Jackson as King Lear, and I was in the throes of Shakespeare's magnificent play and how you incarnate it. My question is, because this was three and a half hours, mm. and you are now 82, you're soon gonna be 83 years old. What does, how does one prepare physically? What do you have to do to have the energy for the performances at night, the matinees? Is there some kind of exercise? I mean, what can you tell us that helps us understand no. how in the world we I can do that? I don't actually, well I do. I mean, my working day starts at two o'clock in the afternoon. So everything is really concentrated on getting to the theater and doing, do you know what I mean? And in, in a sense, I just shut the door <laughs> on everything else from two o'clock and it opens up again at half past 10 at night when it's over. But there is an extraordinary energy within the play itself. And when, as I said earlier, when you touch into that, it's like a jet plane, it just carries you along. and it, it gives you energy back, it's, it's amazing. But I was interested in what you said your reaction was because both in England and here, it is very, very unusual for any member of the audience to, to talk about you know, a woman playing Lear. I mean, that doesn't seem to matter, except I found it quite moving one night, people wait outside, bless them for the autograph. I think they're crazy, but there you go. <laughs> um, particularly when it's raining. But, this woman said to me, she's seen the play many, many times. And she said, it's the first time I've seen the maternal side to Leah. And I thought, that's bloody interesting, actually. I hadn't thought of that, but it must be there somewhere. Well, I mean, it, the fact that Ruth Wilson beautifully plays both Cordelia yeah, yeah. and the fool. Yeah. And if I heard correctly at the very end, when you, this is not, I imagine, a spoiler alert, when you're holding the corpse, my poor fool hang. Mm. Mm. And there is a sense in which it's almost a shared character, someone who oh, yeah. loves the king and is exasperated yes. by the king. And there is a kind of, well, dare I say, female energy that I sensed mm. in the male characters. Mm. But mm. in Shakespeare's time, 
all the female roles were performed by men, right? Yeah. yeah. So in our yeah. time, why can't even right. all the female, well, all the male roles be performed by absolutely. women? Absolutely. But you've made it. You've gone, I think, a little beyond quote an idea of a woman playing Lear. It's Glenda Jackson playing Lear, and it's a Glenda Jackson. If I may, if you'll allow me this one observation, it's someone who has lived a life that wasn't simply in front of the camera or on a stage. It was a life in a political arena with constituents as well as other politicians. And I think that you, perhaps more than most actors, understand the tensions between the public and the private, between ruling and responding to individuals. And when Edgar, at the end of King Lear, says that magnificent line, ripeness is all, I can't help but feel that he is also saying something about you at this moment of your life taking on one of the greatest roles in the English language. Much as I would like to take more questions, we're actually beyond the time that we had allotted for tonight. I just want to say on behalf of everyone here how grateful we are for the time that you spent with us mm. and your career. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, can I just say thank you to them? <laughs> Is it? Can I just... Mm. Okay. <laughs> Don't hear me. One more thing. One more thing. One more, One thing. more thing. I just want to say thank you so very much to you. Thank you. No, no, I haven't quite finished. <laughs> I just want to say every experience I've ever had coming to America, you are the most generous, friendly, kindly giving people in the world. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs>